What do Teslas and dairy barns have in common? Welcome to exploring real-time computer vision using Action Cable with me, Justin Bowen. First, I want to thank you for joining my talk at RailsConf 2021. In this talk, we'll go over some of the computer vision experiences I've had and how I use those experiences to develop cannabis computer vision. Then we'll review the typical architecture I like to use for deploying Rails apps and explore how we can use it for processing imagery with computer vision. This is a cat. How about that? She is a cute cat. We'll just put her down here. Moving along. So what do Teslas and dairy barns have in common? Well, they both use cameras to derive insights using computer vision. Probably the most advanced computer vision applications available to consumers is Tesla's Autopilot. Teslas sport a suite of seven cameras, three front facing with varying fields of view for short 60 meter, mid 150 meter, and long 250 meter range forward facing cameras using wide angle, mid angle, and narrow angle lenses two side front facing cameras with an 80 meter range and two side rear facing cameras with a 100 meter range. These cameras combined with their known specs can be used to measure and assess objects size and distance in front of and around the vehicle. Combined, all of these cameras are processed in real time using GPU powered computer vision on board each Tesla to detect lane markers, vehicles, bikes, motorcycles, cones, pedestrians, trash cans, and intersections using neural networks. Combined with some rules, these components are used to provide feature sets known as Autopilot. Autopilot is a driver assist feature with the ambition of full self-driving capabilities. At the time of this talk, Teslas are able to navigate freeways, change lanes, and take exits automatically. This feature is known as Nav on Autopilot. Teslas can also stop at intersections with red light and stop sign detection. With Teslas in full self-driving beta, they're capable of turning at intersections and driving users from point A to point B with little or no intervention. Teslas today are able to safely keep their lanes with auto steer by monitoring the lane markers. They're also able to park with auto park and unpark using the enhanced unsummon feature, which can allow your car to come to you from across a parking lot. Okay, well that's impressive, but what was I talking about with dairy barns? Well, some modern dairy farmers have computer vision currently being used to monitor dairy barns for cow comfort because comfy cows produce more milk. Cameras monitor, log, and report eating and drinking behavior to give farmers real-time insight into their cow comfort and health metrics. I had the honor of leading the team building this dairy barn offering where we were tasked to deploy computer vision capable of detecting and identifying cows eating and drinking behavior across multiple pens. After all, cows need water and food to make milk. This provides farmers with the ability to determine cow health by alerting them of feeding, drinking, standing, and laying activity. When you're not feeling well, the first thing to go is your appetite and energy. The same is true for a cow. Similarly to Tesla's approach for computer vision, GPUs were deployed in the field in order to analyze cow data on farm in locations with limited bandwidth where streaming video from one camera would have been challenging enough. These remote locations sometimes had tens or hundreds of cameras in order to cover a herd of 4,000 cows across multiple barns. Edge computing was the only option for computer vision since there was no way to upload all of that data to the cloud. So my experience actually started with drones and pivoted to dairy cows and ended up exploring cannabis computer vision. Let's talk a little bit more about my drone experience. In 2016, I joined an Irish company called Canthus with the challenge to build a data pipeline for processing drone flight imagery for field crop analysis. And yes, they switched to dairy cow monitoring in one of the most interesting pivots I've experienced at a startup. 
When I first joined, they were trying to load these massive geotiffs, gigabytes in size, into memory and analyze all of the pixels at once and report back pixel similarity across a field based on user input. The only problem with this process is that it took seven minutes from when the user selected a target to them receiving a heat map and result. While the industry standard for field crop analysis at this scale was 24 hour turnaround, we were determined to devise a new process for breaking up the work to make it more scalable and respond in under a second for a better user experience. The process involved unzipping archive GeoJPEGs and then stitching the GeoJPEGs into a giant mosaic GeoTIFF like before. Again, these were gigabytes in size, but this was only happening once when the flight data was imported into the system. These GeoTIFFs were then tiled with GDAL to tiles to output tiles to be served in a tile map service or TMS URLs. These TMS URLs, which could be used for mapping in Google Map style interfaces, were rendered by Leaflet.js, and this allowed farmers and agronomists the ability to select an area of interest on the map to search the rest of the field for similarity. By outputting a heat map of the similar pixels across the field, or a subset of field tiles, this could be used to determine harvestability or crop failure rate. The business logic required tiles to be processed at render time as TMS image URLs in order to visualize a heat map of this similarity match as well as return a percentage match across the field. So we simply did this at the highest zoom level to reduce the response time. Higher the zoom, the fewer the pixels. We also rendered and processed heat maps for tiles that were currently in the viewport at the zoom level the user was currently on. This created the illusion that the whole field had been processed when really only the TMS URLs requested by Leaflet were processed on demand. These experiences gave me exposure to the architecture and implementation strategy I've used for computer vision. This inspired the work I've done on Green Thumb IO. My blog focused on cannabis cultivation and automation using computer vision as the driving data set. While it seems overwhelming, there are common techniques employed in this process, which I've used for scaling all of the Rails apps I've worked on over the last 10 years. First, let's consider some of the challenges that cultivation has to offer that can be observed visually. Botrytis is one of the most common diseases that impacts various crops from grapes to cannabis. Also known as bud rot, cannabis plants will present discolored bud sites. These spots change color from a healthy bud color to a gray to a brown. Eventually, it ends up covering most of the leaf and bud, causing them to wilt and die. White powdery mildew is a fungal disease that affects a wider variety of plants. Powdery mildew can slow down the growth of plants, and if affected areas become serious enough, it will reduce the yield quality. Plants inf infected with white powdery mildew present an appearance of being dusted with flour. Young foliage is most susceptible to damage, and the leaves can turn yellow and dry out. The fungus might cause leaves to twist or break, become discolored and disfigured. The white spots on the powdery mildew spread over to cover most of the leaves in the affected area. We also have the challenge of tracking biomass rate of growth. It's a key metric when growing any crop. Conventionally, NDVI is an agricultural approach to computer vision used to calculate plant health usually at very low resolution, and more recently with drone flights or stationary cameras indoors. Conventional yield estimates have been calculated in the past by literally throwing a hula hoop into a field and counting the number of plants or bud sites within the known area of the hula hoop. The agronomist can then extrapolate the yield potential from the hoop for a rough statistical estimate of the field's potential yield. So how do we do this with computer vision? First, we have leaf area analysis. 
This can be used for tracking our biomass rate of change to indicate healthy growth or decay from stress. Increases in the number of pixels matching the healthy target color range indicate biomass increase. While changes in target color, something outside of the range will trigger our matching pixel values to drop. We can also do a bud area analysis. This can be used for tracking yield estimates by counting bud sites, tracking their size, and monitoring for signs of stress due to color change at each bud site, which can be tracked for pixel area growth and decay based on their similarity to healthy bud target color range. To start off, we need to define a calibration value for our target of interest. We can use the range detector I found on PyImageSearch.com's IMUtil library to select a low and high HSV color value for the target. In this case here, the target is the bud sites. HSV is a color space value with values of hue, saturation, and value. Dialing up the low end and dialing down the high end, we can capture a pretty clean mask of the bud sites without any additional cleanup. We can use OpenCV for post-processing the image and pixel selection using the calibration HSV target range. We take advantage of Python's Scikit image library and its measuring and label tools for taking measurements and labeling them so that we can have a good understanding of the size of each of our contours. We take these components and use OpenCV to find and annotate images with contours of leaves and buds. So going back to the problem of white powdery mildew, we can use the leaf area mask to detect white powdery mildew by tracking the decay in healthy leaf area pixels. You can see in this example, the leaf on the left is healthy and the leaf on the right shows only a small percentage of its area as healthy leaf pixels. You can also track the rate of biomass increase from these test images to determine week over week growth. The output from week one's leaf mask to week two's leaf mask shows the plants grew 27,918 pixels in five days. Using some basic trig, we can calculate pixels to millimeters. Cameras are really just like pyramids, with the base of the pyramid being the frame of the image and the peak being a horizontal and vertical angle of view. Based on the camera specs and distance to the canopy, we can calculate that approximately 27 square centimeters of cannabis grew in five days. Bud site detection is similar to leaf stress in that we're looking for a rate of growth or decay in a healthy bud area pixels and a change in the color of the contours we've detected as individual bud sites. In this example, you see a large portion of the bud site has turned from a healthy target color to brown. We can also measure and count the size of individual bud sites we've detected. That way, if any bud site changes, color or size, we can alert the users of growth or decay. And we can be very specific which bud site is growing and which bud site may be not doing so well. Here's an early stage visualization of the heat map with data set side by side with the source imagery. In this example, we see leaf area and bud count and size decaying over a matter of hours. The series shows a minute by minute image analysis. After drought induced plant stress, the plants will recover with water but the time spent in this stressed state will reduce the yield potential and also can cause infection to the bud sites, such as white powdery mildew or botrytis. So how do we deploy these visible indicators of plant health with Rails? Well, there are common component services that I prefer to run for all of my Rails apps. Workers doing background jobs, I like to use Sidekick for action cable I usually start with Ruby's cable process, but I found great success with any cable go. For web workers, I use Puma. For essential queuing and PubSub message service, I use Redis. For persistent data storage and querying of datasets, I use Postgres or MySQL depending on the use case. 
I do really appreciate Postgres's extension PostGIS for the ability to geo-index and geo-query. When I use OpenCV, I like to use Python as it's a developer-friendly language that I've come to appreciate. Very similar to Ruby, but with some differences. The nice thing about this architecture is you can scale up individual services independently. As work and jobs increase for the background workers, we can scale up our sidekick processes or servers. When WebSocket connections increase and our CPU load or memory increases, we can scale up our cable service. And when HTTP requests go up, and we need more workers, we can scale up our Puma processes. All of this can be done independently without one overloaded service taking down the entire system. It can be overwhelming to view the architecture all at once. So we'll take things step by step and visualize how each component of the system interacts to provide a user experience that exposes the inference derived from our computer vision analysis. The first thing we'll talk about is the different ways of running the code in various deployment environments. The OpenCV code can run on devices like the Raspberry Pi, which can be accelerated with Intel's Movidius vision processing units, or even the new OpenCV AI kit, which has the Movidius Myriad X VPU already integrated. This can significantly increase your frame-by-frame -frame processing time with an edge-based implementation. After image capture and analysis, the number of bud sites and their individual sizes can also be reported to the Rails app, either through Puma and an HTTP request, or Action Cable using a Python WebSocket connection to our Action Cable service. This way, we can offload some of the server-side processing like leaf area and bud area to the camera. In this case, the pre- and post-processed images can be uploaded to the Rails app or directly to S3 using direct file uploads. The metrics such as the leaf area and bud area in pixels, or converted to millimeters based on their distance from the camera, can then be uploaded to our database so that we can store them in a geo-index in Postgres. Another option is cloud computing the captured images after uploading from the browser or devices. I like to use Thumbbore which is a Python image service that can be extended with our computer vision code using Thumbbore's OpenCV engine. Computer vision code is deployed to Google Cloud Platform's Cloud Run service, where you can deploy highly scalable containerized applications on a fully managed serverless platform. I use Docker to do this. With a URL from a direct file upload, the Rails app can use the image service in the cloud and provide users with processed image URLs. I've packaged the leaf area and butt area into Thumbbor filters that can be passed into the URL as parameters with the HSV color space lower and upper bounds as arguments. The Thumbbor filters have been put into Python pip packages and are installable through pip via PyPI, or PyPy. It's similar to RubyGems. This code is used in a Thumbbore container deployed to Google Cloud Run. The Thumbbore image service is extended using the two methods, and all it needs is an input image URL. And then it outputs a processed image, masking leaf area or butt area. The method can also take a channel identifier for notifying back to action cable Again, using Python WebSocket client or Puma through an HTTP request. Either can be done and both can notify through Action Cable eventually. You can see here the S3 image on the right and the Thumbbore image service on the left. When combined, they output the masked image. We'll call this the Green Thumbbore. I actually named the repo that I pushed to GitHub the Green Thumb Image API. But while I was putting these slides together for this talk, I thought of Green Thumbbore. Thought it sounded better. Anyway, so I've mentioned a couple times direct file uploads. What are they? Well, they're a great way to relieve pressure on our Rails apps. Puma workers can focus on responding to HTTP requests quickly without having to wait for blocking I.O. from large objects like images and videos. With AWS S3 or Google Cloud Store, 
our Rails app can provide a client browser or device with a pre-signed key to upload files to a location on our storage service directly. Once the files are transferred, the client can notify the Rails app that these files can now be processed or served. From there, we can insert the image URL data into our database and enqueue a background job with the image ID and a channel identifier to a sidekick worker. And respond, okay. The job will make a request to the Thumbor image service to process the image URL and send back a response to the channel's report action. Sidekick handles the third-party API request to Thumbor service to keep the external requests in the background and off of our Puma workers plate. The report action will then receive a message, again, either from the Thumbor service directly using Action Cable or from Puma. In this visualization, you see it coming from the Thumbor service directly to our AnyCable service, which can enqueue a job to update the inference data into our SQL database and broadcast our Action Cable subscribers. The Action Cable consumers that are subscribed to this channel can then render the image and graph the values. So, if you'll... Look at this graph. Looking at this graph, we see again our rate of decay in healthy leaves and bud area can be used to generate an alert or trigger an automated watering. This is a time series over a span of three hours, and you can see there's plenty of time to alert the user before it's too late. This video was provided by my friends at Super Green Lab. They sell smart micro-grow systems using LEDs and sensors controlled by a custom-designed ESP-based PCB. They also use Raspberry Pis for capturing time lapses. Another great use for Action Cable is WebRTC signaling. WebRTC signaling allows two clients to establish peer-to-peer -peer connections. This allows bidirectional communication of audio, video, and data without a trip to our WebSocket server. This involves sending a session descriptor offer from one peer to the other and sending a session descriptor answer back to the other peer. Then both peers can request a token, which they can use in order to create what's called interactive connectivity establishment candidates or ICE candidates. Once the peer connection is established, bi-directional communication from device to browser can be accomplished. This allows real-time video feed from the camera to your browser and the ability to trigger things from your browser to the camera, which could control sensors, actuators, fans, or pumps. While I've seen implementations of WebRTC signaling done with HTTP polling, I've had great success using an action cable to handle the initial exchange of ICE candidates. Now the question, does it scale? Short answer is yes. I've been using Puma for a while for my web workers. These are just some graphs of the memory footprint and the responsiveness at scale that I pulled from their website. And Nate Berkopek, author of The Complete Guide to Rails Performance and co-maintainer of Puma, recently said on Twitter, the things you need to know about a service in order to scale it properly, or you need to know the queue times for work, and jobs and requests, the average processing time and arrival rate for work and jobs, and the CPU load utilization, CPU count and memory utilization of the underlying machine. This really goes for any language and any framework. I recently had a consultation with a startup founder with a contract developer, and they were asking me if I thought .NET was scalable. I used our time together to help them better understand the systems and concepts required for a scalable system, and that it's always best to use what the developer feels most comfortable and productive using. I love Ruby, and I feel most productive and confident scaling a Rails app. Python is very friendly for me too, but I wouldn't say I love or feel comfortable with Django, though I have deployed some Django apps before. And I certainly wouldn't personally feel comfortable scaling a .NET application, but in that case, I told the startup founder that they should listen to their developer and make sure that they follow scaling practices 
that I've outlined here in .NET with different tools similar to Puma and Sidekick and potentially a WebSocket service if they need it. Anyway, I highly recommend checking out Nate's book and giving him a follow on Twitter for great write-ups on optimizing Rails apps. I've been using Sidekick since around 2012, and I really appreciate the work that Mike Perham has done with Contribsys.com, which is responsible for Sidekick and Factory. Factory provides a feature-filled job processing system for all languages with a common queuing mechanism using Redis that supports workers in Node, Python, Ruby, Go, Elixir, and more. While I haven't used Factory, I am curious and excited to see how our architecture could be enhanced with background jobs across our Rails and Python code bases. But Sidekick itself is 20 times faster than in the competition. I think the old saying was that one Sidekick worker can do the work of 20 rescue jobs, something like that. It does scale. Nate also said something on Twitter that WebSockets are far more difficult to scale than HTTP in a lot of ways. The lack of HTTP caching and the ability to offload to CDN are big ones for him. You can see in this graph CPU load comparison on the left of AnyCable Go to the right of Action Cable Ruby with 10,000 concurrent connections each. The Ruby cable service is fully loaded, while the any cable service has headroom to spare. You can also notice in this graph of memory consumption, with Ruby using four times as much memory as any cable Go. In these load tests that I found online, any cable Go has similar performance under load to Go and Erlang natively. I haven't used early cable, but it appears to have similar performance metrics. So this is a report showing the decay from the video we saw earlier with a graph where the plants were wilting from not being watered. This is over a span of 10 hours, so there was plenty of time to notify the user that there was a critical issue that needed their attention sooner rather than later, when they may not have come to see the issue until the next day. So going back to the initial step of manual calibration, how can we overcome this step? Well, masked images are great annotated data sets, and these can be used as training data for training a neural network. We could potentially leverage the detection of bud sites and leaves without calibration. This would be a great opportunity to integrate with something like TensorFlow to use what's called transfer learning. Transfer learning takes an existing neural network trained to detect objects and teaches it to recognize new ones like buds and leaves. There's a lot of theory and techniques out there, and I have experience with some of these, but not all of them. It's important to explore and experiment with common solutions in practice, but not to get too overwhelmed with theory, especially when starting out. So where do you go from here? Adrian Rosebrock, PhD from PyImageSearch.com, says, learn by doing and skip the theory. You don't need complicated theory. You don't need pages of complex math equations, and you certainly don't need a degree in computer science or mathematics. I personally don't have a degree, so I appreciate him saying that. All you need is a basic understanding of programming and a willingness to learn. I feel like that goes for a lot of things, not just machine learning or deep learning or computer vision, but programming in general. Don't get me wrong, having a degree in computer science or mathematics won't hurt anything. And yes, there's a time and a place for theory, but it's certainly not when you're just getting started. And there's a lot you can do off the shelf. Pi Image Search is a great resource with computer vision and deep learning examples and tutorials. And there are many off the shelf solutions that Adrian will walk you through, including face detection and recognition, facial landmarks that are used for things like Snapchat filters, body pose estimations for things like human interface devices using the human body like the Xbox Connect, object detection and segmentation, similar to what we just did with leaf area and butt area, but for things like cats and dogs and other common objects, optical character recognition for reading text and images, super resolution, like in CSI, when they would zoom and say enhance and the image got clearer. It's actually something you can do with a deep neural network these days. 
And there's also interesting computer vision medical applications, such as detecting if people are wearing masks or detecting COVID in lung x-ray images. So what else is there? How can we integrate machine learning and deep learning into our Rails apps without computer vision? Well, aside from computer vision, there are things like NLP, where you can analyze the meaning of text. Computer audio, where you can analyze sound. Recommendation engines. And even inverse kinematics, where you can train robots to control themselves. That could be an interesting use for WebRTC connections for low latency, peer-to-peer -peer communication to control them or send commands. But most importantly, have fun with it. And thank you for watching my talk. If you're interested in learning more about these topics, check out greenthumb.io or follow me on Twitter. I'm always happy to collaborate. And there's my cat. She's been with me this entire talk. And if you follow me on Twitter, I did say that she helped me out. So got to include the cat tax at the end of this. I'm also open to consulting or potentially taking on a full-time employment opportunity if it's the right opportunity, whether it's through my agency, CFO Media and Technology, or as myself, an experienced product and team builder. I would love to chat and look forward to getting to know the community more. Thank you. Look at this cat. That's all.